This week we travel to Umbria in Italy to find out how to make porchetta at home. Then we do smashed potatoes with horseradish with a drizzle of spicy oil. And finally, a foolproof chocolate crostata with a flavor of chocolate and hazelnut. So stay tuned for the perfect winter meal right here on Milk Street. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. Cooking happens in the kitchen but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. This week on Milk Street, we travel to Umbria in Italy. We go to a small town called Gruti. Gruti has about 500 residents. There's still three or four families who make the dish we're gonna cook today, porchetta. Now, unlike my Vermont pig roast, which is a 60 pound pig cooked in a box, they do this quite differently. This is a big pig, it's 200 pounds, and they completely bone it out. They fill it with rosemary and wild fennel, maybe some seasoned organ meats like liver, and then they sew it up over a metal rod. In fact, one of the families we visited used a metal tine from a beach umbrella as the sewing needle. Finally, it's cooked all day until the outside is crisp and the inside is nice and soft. So let's go figure out how to cook porchetta the Milk Street way. So in Umbria, they have a 200 pound pig. In Vermont, I have like a 60 pound pig. And here you've got like a seven or eight pound piece of pig. Is that right? Home cooks are not making full pigs at home. So we decided to make a porchetta work with a Boston butt, which is one of my absolute favorite cuts. It has a beautiful fat cap on it, which is gonna crisp up in the oven and be really beautiful. And we're gonna fill it with this beautiful paste with herbs and spices and more pork. So let's go ahead and make our paste now. We're gonna start with eight ounces of pancetta. You know, this is unsmoked pork belly, so let's add that in first. And we're gonna pulse that to break it down a little bit. To the pancetta, we're gonna add butter. It's about fat to fat? Fat to fat. So, four tablespoons salted butter, a full cup of fresh rosemary leaves, a full cup of oregano leaves. Mm. I don't know, it smells great. Two teaspoons of kosher salt, red pepper flakes, a full tablespoon, 20 garlic cloves, and then a whopping half cup of ground fennel. So fennel and rosemary are really the two key ingredients in, in garlic that went into a traditional porchetta, right? They are. In traditional porchetta, they often use wild fennel, uh, which has even really strong, even more robust flavor. So we're gonna break this down to a paste. It takes about one minute. So that's looking good. Let's transfer it to a bowl. We're gonna put this paste inside the butterfly pork butt when we're ready. And we're gonna coat the outside with even more fennel and sugar and salt and pepper. So two more tablespoons ground fennel, a tablespoon of kosher salt, two tablespoons of brown sugar, and two teaspoons ground black pepper. The world's tiniest whisk. Matt, this whisk is ridiculous for this. Put your hands in it, man. Okay. There you go. That works beautifully. Okay, so now we have a spice rub for the outside of the pork, and the paste for inside. So now it's time to butcher the pork. Boneless Boston butts come with a seam from where the bone has been removed. So we're just gonna take advantage of that and open it up flat. So use a sharp chef's knife and just follow the seam that where it's already been cut. So we can open it right up, use small short cuts and keep looking at it because you really don't want to cut all the way through it, then you won't be able to roll it right up. 
So what we're going to do is create more surface area by making slices. So about every inch, we're going to make a cut halfway down. Use your finger to sort of open up the seam a little to make sure you're cutting deep enough. OK, now comes the fun part. We're going to put the paste in all those nooks and crannies. It's really important that this paste not be too cold. If it's too cold, there's so much fat in there, it's just going to slide around and not stick. I'm really making sure I'm getting it in all those cuts. So what's the definition of porchetta? Is it the boned pig that's stuffed with herbs? Yeah. I mean, it, this is not something most people do at home. I mean, it's like barbecue here. You may be on your own roasting a whole pig up in Vermont, but this is something people buy out, really. As you can see, we've got the whole thing stuffed here. We're going to roll it back up, and we want to make sure that the fat cap is on top, right? Because that's going to end up right. roasting. So going to work. and. Coil it up pretty tight here, and it's, it's pretty ungainly. You have to use a little body English to shape it back up. So now we're shaped up, and we're going to tie it. So I never learned that, that butcher's trick of tying it in one long piece. So I use multiple pieces here. And I think it really helps keep it very even. So one, two. You need about seven pieces of twine, about 28 to 30 inches each. So I tie in the center, then I'm going to work my way to the outside. Depending whether your roast is seven or eight pounds will depend how many times you need to wrap it up. I think we may be good with about seven here. And you want kitchen twine that's oven safe, not you stuff do. that has other stuff on it. Of course, untreated kitchen right. twine. And the thicker, the better. I find sometimes some kitchen twine is really small, so it ends up cutting into the meat rather than holding onto the meat. So with the paste on the inside, it's time to rub it now. The way I like to do it is I like to put it right in the container and start the flesh side and cover it. And then roll it back over and coat the top. Make sure to coat the sides. What we're going to do now is we're going to wrap it up in plastic wrap and then refrigerate it for 24 to 48 hours. Now, the time may seem a little excessive, but it really helps those flavors penetrate into the meat. So Chris, the roast was wrapped up tight in plastic wrap in the fridge for 24 hours. Now we're going to roast it. First of all, we're going to add four cups of water to the bottom of the roasting pan. This helps keep the roast moist. It also helps prevent the fawn from burning. And we want to really use those brown bits later on for both the sauce and to help flavor some roast fennel we're going to do. So 300 degrees, middle rack, roasting to 195 at the very center of the roast. And this is, what, six or seven hours? Is that the time? It's about six or seven hours. Okay. The best thing about that? completely unattended. You don't have to baste it. Just six or seven hours, 195, 300. So pull the roast out, and we're not done yet, right? Because what happens with a roast? It has to rest. It has to rest. With a roast this size, an hour is perfect. So we're going to do a couple things in that hour. We're going to make both a sauce and then we're going to roast some fennel in that really delicious looking fond. So we drained off all the juices that were in the pan into the fat separator. And now we've got three quarter cup of the juices. Look at that, like inky, delicious, really flavorful juices. We're going to add a third cup of lemon juice. Now we're going to add a quarter cup of water to this. Sounds odd because you really want the flavor to be strong, but it helps balance things out. Two tablespoons extra virgin olive oil brings up that fruity flavor two teaspoons fresh ground black pepper, and more ground fennel. So we keep layering those flavors, right? So we've got the fresh fennel that we're going to roast. We have all the fennel inside and outside. In the meantime, let's get that roast fennel going. Oven's at 450, and we're going to use four large fennel bulbs. Now, fennel comes mostly with these fronds attached. So we're going to cut those off. And make sure you save these. I knew, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Put it in the back of your refrigerator no. next to the, the <laughs> fat from the... You can chop it up and use it in tuna salad, egg salads, and they're really delicious tossed with pasta. You can slice them thin, add them to salad. Just use it. Don't waste it. Well, you had a lot of answers there. I okay. do. So. I usually do, Chris. I throw it out. <laughs> it's okay. Going to cut that funnel bulb in half. It's really important to take out that hard core. So what I'm going to do is going to cut out that bottom first, and then I'm just going to sort of notch it out. So use the tip of my knife to make a little V notch. And then I'm just going to cut around into large wedges. 
I'm gonna add that fennel right over to my roasting pan. Add the remainder here. Again, that was four bulbs total. Toss it with a quarter cup extra virgin olive oil and a teaspoon kosher salt. So we're just gonna stir it up. Then we're gonna roast it at 450 for about 20 minutes. Pull it out, give it a stir, help loosen up some of that browning. Put it back in, take it out in another 10 minutes. Add a half cup of water to help loosen up that fond and all the caramelization in the bottom of the pan and cook it for about another 10 minutes. So it's about 40 minutes total, and that's perfect because your meat is gonna be resting for an hour. At long last, we've arrived at the moment. We have. So again, this rested for about an hour before we're gonna cut it. Mm. Do you like the end piece? Well, I don't know. I would say no, I would prefer a piece from the interior. Okay, let's get one for you. Can I get you some fennel? Yeah. And a splash of sauce. Mm-hmm. That looks pretty good. Oh, this is like going over to Matt's place. Oh, wow. That is good. It's really intense. And the way the top crisps, that's just fantastic. The sauce is nice and bright. Mm-hmm. Oh. Cuts the richness, really brings up the fennel flavor. So instead of doing the first Saturday of the month roast pork in Vermont, we'll actually do a porchetta, I think, which is nice and light and bright, has rosemary, it has fennel, of course, fennel actually four ways, has a nice stuffing coating on the outside, you roast the fennel in the pan while the roast is resting for an hour, but great flavor, and it's, it's light and bright as well. So that's it, rosemary fennel porchetta from Milk Street. I think um, this is a keeper. I do too. I'm sure most of you don't even need a recipe for mashed potatoes anymore. You cook the potatoes, add some hot melted butter to coat the starch granules, then add the milk or half and half, et cetera. Well, it turns out there is something new under the sun, especially in Southern Indian cooking. They often take some oil, spiced oil, and pour that over the food just before serving. So we're going to borrow that concept now to uh, revitalize our notion of mashed potatoes. We are, Chris. We're going to do our own version of tarka, which is that spice-infused oil or butter that you talked about. So we started with some basic mashed potatoes. We took four pounds of Yukon Gold. We peeled them, we quartered them, covered them with about two inches of water. We like to add a tablespoon of kosher salt, five bay leaves, and actually four smashed garlic cloves. We bring it up to a boil, then turn your heat down to about medium and simmer it for, say, 20 to 25 minutes. I'm going to add six tablespoons of salted butter, which we have melted and just mash that up. Rather modest amount, Rather I would say. Modest amount. One thing to note, Chris, you don't have to be too precious about this, but you do want your potatoes to be in even chunks because you want them to cook evenly, right? That's how we keep from getting the bad kind of lumps or, or gluey mashed potatoes. Now we're gonna add, for more richness, one and three quarters cup of warmed half and half. For flavor, we have a half a cup of prepared horseradish. So this is just the stuff from the grocery store. You can get any brand you'd like. And then we strained out the horseradish, but we reserved three tablespoons of that briny liquid. And that's gonna add even more flavor and brightness. I'm gonna stir that all together. This is looking more like the consistency we want. So now that that's all mixed up, we're gonna taste it for seasoning. Okay, Chris, so I have this on really low and I'm gonna cover it and I'll just keep it nice and warm while we make the tarka. Okay. Now, back to our butter pan. Put this over medium heat. We have four more tablespoons of salted butter. I feel much better about this whole thing right now because it was only six tablespoons. You were a little anxious, yeah. I could tell. A tablespoon of yellow mustard seeds and a tablespoon of caraway seeds. And you can see we beat these up a little bit. If you have a mortar and pestle, you can use that. Otherwise, you could just put them in a zip top bag and maybe hit it with a cast iron skillet. It just really helps the flavor release into the brown butter. And it's very tempting to bump up the heat, but we don't want to get any sort of scorched spots and it, it'll go really quickly from brown butter to, to black butter. So we're gonna let the seeds toast and let the butter melt. You're looking for it to foam, and of course, we want it to turn brown. Now, your nose is really important here as much as your eyes. You're gonna start to smell that nutty aroma, and that's when you know that you're on the right track. And also, I've noticed brown butter gets a little bit quiet right before it's ready. You get all intense bubbling in the beginning, and then as the milk solids start to separate and cook, everything gets a little bit quiet. So should we talk softly? We should. All right, the mustard seeds are popping. I'm gonna strain the butter. And you see that beautiful kind of caramel brown color? I just enjoyed the popping, you know. <laughs> so now we can plate our mashed potatoes. 
This is one of those dishes that you want to serve really nice and warm. So make sure you keep your potatoes warm while you make your tarka. By the way, if you want to make mashed potatoes ahead, don't put in all the liquid, like reserve some of the liquid, and when you reheat them, then add in the, the rest that you took out initially. So we've transferred them to the serving bowl, and now I'm just going to pour on the tarka. Mmm. Gravy. Mmm. And now we have two tablespoons of fresh chives, and that'll add just a pop of color, a little bit of freshness. I'll get you an extra buttery bite. You do want to bring it to the table with that beautiful presentation, but give it a good stir so that everyone gets a little bit of that yummy tarka. Mmm. You know what's really interesting about cooking for a long time is you think you know something, and then it turns out you really don't know anything. Because this is much better than the mashed potatoes I've been making since like 1968. Sometimes mashed potatoes are kind of the bland, sad side dish, and you have to add a lot to make them taste good. These have so much flavor just on their own. You say something negative about mashed potatoes? Uh, what's wrong with a blank canvas? Anyway, mashed potatoes with caraway mustard butter. This is not a blank canvas at all. A little bit of horseradish in there as well. And the horseradish is a little sweet, but it's not spicy. But just adds a sort of depth of flavor. So, next time you want to make mashed potatoes, maybe for the holidays, try this mashed potatoes with caraway mustard butter. Excellent. Every home baker I know has asked me to solve the problem of pie dough or tarte dough. So today, Erica is going to solve that problem by, by coming up with a pat in the pan crust based on an Italian recipe called pasta frolla. That's and right. we actually looked at Jim Leahy's Sullivan Street Bakery book, who has a recipe for that, but it's a whole wheat version of it, which mm -hmm. we like. So this is going to be a pat in the pan crust with a chocolate hazelnut filling. Nothing wrong with that. No, I, don't think. I think you're going to be really happy with okay. this recipe because it is really straightforward and it's very, very easy and it, it, it doesn't require all of those steps that you mentioned. First, I'm going to add half a cup of all-purpose flour, quarter cup of whole wheat flour. I'm going to add a quarter cup of white sugar and then a quarter teaspoon of baking powder. What? Yeah, that is uncommon, but it mm. really adds a nice lightness to this. And then just a quarter teaspoon of kosher salt. I'm just going to process this for a few seconds to combine it. Now we're going to add our butter. I have six tablespoons here of salted butter and it's been chilled. I'm just going to scatter this over top okay, and we're going to pulse this about ten times until it's texture of coarse sand. Okay. All right, you can see that most of the butter is incorporated. There's still a few larger pieces. We're going to add one egg yolk and a half a teaspoon of vanilla extract for flavor. And then I'm just going to process this about 20 to 30 seconds. We don't want the dough to come completely together in a ball. We want it to stay in sort of larger clumps. So it's going to be much easier to transfer it to our pan. OK, I'm going to stop there. This is a nine inch spring form pan. It's been lightly sprayed with cooking spray. So clumpy is a professional baking yeah. term? <laughs> found that it's much easier to press it in because if it's all a ball and that way you can just sort of sprinkle it evenly along the bottom of the pan. Just got hot this is today. always the moment when you're thinking to yourself, do I have enough <laughs> pastry dough to, to cover the bottom of the pan? <laughs> little panic alarm goes A little up. bit of panic. This couldn't possibly be enough. Now we're not going to chill it, but the last thing we need to do before we bake it is we're just going to dock it with a fork. And this is so that it doesn't develop any air bubbles that come up from underneath. Just going to do it about every half inch. This is good if you're angry at somebody. Well, there are only two of us here, so I mean. <laughs> okay, that's it. We have a 375 degree oven ready with the rack placed in the lowest position. And I'm going to put this in there to bake for about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, Chris, so we've just taken out our crust. You can see it looks great. It's nice, light golden brown and we're ready to go ahead and make our filling while we let this cool slightly. We wanted to replicate this wonderful confection they have in Italy, and it's called Genduia. And it's, it's just like a chocolate bar, but it's made with hazelnut paste and chocolate together. Is that what that is? That's what this is. Are it's, you offering me some? Would you like to try yes. some? It's wonderful. Are well, you just going to like let it sit on the <laughs> counter? I'm just going to show it to you, and then I'm going <laughs> to take it home. <laughs> but it's really good. It's really mm. nice and creamy. It's got a nice flavor. Well, if we can do that, then we'll be all set. Yeah. Um, here we have a cup and a quarter of toasted 
peeled hazelnuts. If you can't find the peeled ones in the store, you can just toast ones with the skin on them in the 375 degree oven for about 10 minutes. You transfer them to a kitchen towel and then rub really vigorously and that will get the skins right off. We're gonna go ahead and put these in our food processor. I'm just gonna pulse these about eight times. I wanna roughly chop them. Okay, I'm gonna measure out a quarter cup of the roughly chopped hazelnuts, and this is gonna go on top of our tart. Set this aside. Now we're gonna to add to the nuts three quarter cup of white sugar. Now we're gonna process this really well, about two minutes. We really, really want this finely ground, but we wanna actually make a paste out of this. Let's check this. Oh, that looks good. All right, good. that looks good, yeah. And you can really see that it's starting to form a paste in there. I'm just gonna scrape down the sides here. And now we're ready to add our eggs. These are three egg whites. And traditionally, you know, or like a chocolate tart you think has a lot of yolks, it has a lot of butter. But we found with the, all the fat and the oils that we're adding from the hazelnuts mm. that that caused the filling to actually separate and it was way too greasy. So three egg whites. If we are good at marketing, we just call it a natural chocolate hazelnut tart. Natural? Natural. <laughs> We've got two teaspoons of vanilla extract teaspoon of espresso powder, which is a really nice addition, sort of played off against the richness of the hazelnuts. And then a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. Okay, we're just gonna process this for about 10 seconds. Okay. Now last, but certainly not least, we have four ounces of bittersweet chocolate. I have already melted this. I did this in a microwave at 50% power, and I stirred it every 30 seconds. It takes about three minutes. And again, this needs to process for about 10 seconds. Okay, and we're done. Now this is gonna go right into our still warm shell. And this bakes up almost to like a brownie-like consistency. So we can totally get away without having sides on this. Okay, and we just wanna get this into an even layer. And now I'm just gonna put our nut garnish. I'm just gonna sprinkle this around the outside edge, just cause it's pretty. It also adds a nice crunch. So it's ready to go into the oven now. It's the same 375 degree oven we had before on the rack set in the lowest position. It's gonna bake for about 20 to 25 minutes. We're gonna look for the whole thing to puff slightly. The edges will be just a little bit cracked. Okay, Chris, so our crostata has been cooling for 15 minutes, and we can go ahead and dive in. I've been cooling for 15 minutes, right, too. Exactly. I'm just going to release the sides of the pan, and it looks great. It even looks like a brownie, doesn't it? It's got that nice papery brownie skin. It's a roundy. It's a roundy. A round brownie, yeah. <laughs> All right. Looks good. I'm, I'm looking You're at inspecting it. I'm thinking, it. I'm inspecting it from all sides. Yeah, this looks good. Got a nice gooey center. Yeah, it looks gooey on the, oh, yeah. this looks very good. Yeah. The crust is what I'm really excited about, too. Oh, no, you're just gonna look at your straw while you no, mind. What are you gonna it. do? No, I'm right. gonna eat it. Looks too good. Mmm. This isn't a brownie. This is like better. Better. It's this pretty is, intense. It's, it's kind of almost creamy and silky and hazelnutty and a lot of other stuff. It's really unusual because it has that crust, sort of soft, crumbly cookie like the hazelnuts on top. And the inside is dense but creamy and it's not overpoweringly chocolate. So if you'd like to solve the problem of making and rolling out a pie pastry crust, which is sort of hard to do, you can make this chocolate crostata with a pasta frolla whole wheat crust. It's pat in the pan. You don't even have to use pie waste to pre-bake it. And then the rest of it, the chocolate hazelnut filling is done in a food processor, pours right in and bakes about half an hour. One of my favorite all-time desserts. Thank you. So you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season of Mill Street at MillStreetTV.com. Funding for this series was provided by the following. Ferguson's proud to support Milk Street and culinary crusaders everywhere. For more information on our extensive collection of kitchen products, we're on the web at fergusonshowrooms.com. For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit consumercellular.tv. 
Cooking happens in the kitchen, but life happens around the kitchen table. The 1919 Collection, celebrating yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Visit us at www.1919cookware.com. They're going to be wonderful nibbles. They're often served on the side. Um, we're going to go round. Theirs is not million dollar melons, but expensive strawberries that are hothouse grown and they're delicious. Wow. The variety is Tochi Otome, which is a particular varietal that's extremely sweet. And they have some samples out if you want to take a sample. Yeah, I'd love to take a sample. Oh, those are delicious. Aren't they good? Yeah. 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 